During the COVID-19 pandemic, a group of researchers played a part in the testing process for 384 healthcare workers who appeared healthy. Since less than 1% of healthy people are actually asymptomatic carriers of the coronavirus, every healthy person has a very small chance of testing positive. On the other hand, since they are healthcare workers, it is very important that any positive cases are identified. The researchers took samples from all 384 healthcare workers, but performed only 48 tests. Nevertheless, from the results of these tests, they were able to identify all four positive people out of the 384 people. This cuts down on the cost of testing to one eighth of the usual cost, which is marvelous. But how do they manage this? For one, they pool samples together and test them. The concept of a pool test is straightforward. Mix together a bit of the samples from various people into one pooled sample. Test the pooled sample. If all of the people whose samples were used were negative, then the pooled sample will test negative. If any of the people were positive, the sample will test positive. There are some complications. We can't pool too many samples together because if only one individual is positive, then the sample will be mostly negative and the test might not return a positive. So we have to consider the sensitivity of the tests when implementing this, but we'll overlook that for now and come back to it in the end. For now, we assume the tests we perform are perfect. Using pool tests, we can think of testing strategies where we split the people into groups and do one pool test for each group. In the next round of testing, only consider the positive groups. Within them, make new groups and then proceed as before. Now, this idea of pooled tests isn't new. It originated in 1943 during World War II when the US Army was screening potential recruits for a rare disease, and it has since become commonplace for group testing in various settings. The original idea involves splitting people into small groups, and for groups that test positive, you test all its members individually. That's only two rounds of testing. It's only natural that if you allow more rounds of testing, you can decrease the number of tests needed. On the other hand, nobody wants to wait for multiple rounds of testing before getting their results. So in the paper initially mentioned where only one eighth the number of tests were needed, how many rounds of testing did they use? The surprising answer is one. They chose which pooled tests to do right at the beginning. Did those tests and from the results without any additional tests, they could figure out which people were positive under the assumption that very few would be positive. To be crystal clear, let's try to do something like that ourselves. Here is our task. We want to come up with a list of pooled tests with the guarantee that if there are at most three people who are positive, we should be able to tell from the results of the pooled tests exactly which people are positive. If there are more than three people who are positive, we should be able to say that there are more than three people who are positive. We might not be able to tell exactly who they are, the idea is that since we're looking for unlikely infections, it's really unlikely that there will be more than three positive cases. But even in this unlikely scenario, we'll be able to notice it and do a second round of testing if needed. We're just using three here as an example. The concepts in this video will apply even when three is replaced with another number. This task is called non-adaptive combinatorial group testing. The group testing part is obvious. The non-adaptive part is because we have chosen which tests to do right at the beginning and we don't adaptively choose what tests to do based on the results of previous tests. The combinatorial part is because to solve this task, we're going to have to design some objects with a very special pattern, which is a common theme in combinatorics. This video will focus on figuring out what pattern we need and how we can come up with such a pattern. Since it's really about this mathematical pattern, what we see in this video will also be relevant to many more applications apart from just screening people for infections. So what is it we're trying to design? We want to come up with a set of pooled tests, which we'll specify in the form of this table. Each row represents one person. Each column represents one pooled test. In the first column, we specify which people's samples are going to be included in the first pooled test. By specifying the samples for each column, we have specified exactly what our pooled tests are going to be. If we look at the first row, it's telling us that the first person's samples are included in the second 5th, 7th, and 8th pooled tests. Once we've filled in our table, we can go ahead and perform the pooled tests. Remember that if a pooled test turns up negative, all the samples involved must be negative. So every person who contributed to those negative tests can safely be labeled as negative. We won't be making any mistakes there. That leaves us with people who have tested all positive. If we label these people as positives, can we be making a mistake? In other words, is it possible for somebody to be negative 
but yet all the pool samples they participated in to turn up positive? It actually is possible if our table was not designed properly. The question we want to answer is what property should our table have to make this impossible? Remember that we are working with the assumption that there are at most three positive people. You can pause the video if you want to figure out the property for yourself. Okay, so let's see an example of a mistake happening. If person one and person five are actually positive, that explains all the positive tests here. But this means that if any other person like person seven here has samples only in tests that one and five were involved in, they would test all positive, even though they could actually be negative. All their samples were masked by persons one and five. So that's the problem. If there are up to three people whose samples mask the samples of another person, then that's a place we might make a mistake. If the three people turn up positive, then the other person is doomed to be involved in only positive tests. So the property we want for our table is this. No three rows should have samples that collectively mask the samples of another row. If we can get a table with this property, we've solved the task we set ourselves. We label everybody with a negative test as negative. If there are at most three people who are still unlabeled, then there are at most three positive people. And so no negative person is masked and all the unlabeled people are actually positive. If there are more than three people who are unlabeled, then there must be more than three positive people. Because if there were at most three positive people, they wouldn't mask anybody else. This property is called three disjunctness. So the question we face now is, how do we design tables that are three disjunct? Intuitively, we want that the samples in various rows don't overlap too much. How do we create barely overlapping rows? For this, we'll look at an even more fundamental and well-studied pattern. This more fundamental pattern of tables is much easier to describe and is based on the more basic notion of distance. For two rows of a table, the distance between the two rows is the number of places where the two rows differ. For example, the distance between these two rows is three. The more fundamental table pattern that will be useful for us is for every two rows to have sufficient distance between them. A scenario where this pattern pops up is easy to describe. Say you're planning to send some information over to a friend and you can transfer a signal of eight bits. Since two to the eight is 256, there are 256 different messages that you can send. So you choose a message to send. But then if one of the bits gets flipped when sending the signal, your friend could get a different signal than the one you sent and would interpret it as a message that you did not intend. So what you do instead is you decide beforehand on a set of signals such that every two signals are different in at least two places. And you'll only send one of those signals. We can find 128 such signals, so there are 128 different messages that we can send. Now if you choose a message to send and a bit gets flipped, the signal your friend receives won't be the signal you sent, but it also won't be interpreted as a different message because there are no two messages that are just one bit flip away from each other. Your friend will be able to tell that some corruption occurred and won't end up thinking you sent them a message that you didn't intend to. You can think of our list of messages as the rows of a table where every two rows has distance at least two. If you change the pattern from distance two to distance three, you get even stronger capabilities like detecting two bit flips or even correcting one bit flip. Tables with such patterns are central to the field of error correcting codes. The way we define the pattern is as a table in which every two rows has at least some distance between them. Using a straightforward restatement, let's see another way to think of it. As a table in which every two rows agree in at most some number of places. Deferring a lot is the same as not agreeing much. For two rows of eight bits, deferring in at least two places is the same as agreeing in at most six places. The second view will be really helpful to us. And that's because we already know of mathematical objects that agree in very few places, polynomials. If you take any two different polynomials, they can't intersect more times than the maximum of their degrees. For instance, here we have two polynomials of degree five, and in this case, they intersect in five points. There is a more fundamental reason for this. If we subtract one polynomial from the other, this new polynomial also has degree at most five. But every time the two original polynomials intersected, this new polynomial has value zero. And a non-zero polynomial of degree at most five can have at most five roots, that is five places where it is zero. So from this more fundamental statement, 
we can conclude that the original two polynomials can only intersect at five places. If you want a proof of this more fundamental statement, there is a link in the description to another video in which I have given a proof of it. This property of polynomials is great news for us. Let's take a few values of x. Here minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now let's take a polynomial of degree at most 3 and evaluate it at these points. And we do the same for another polynomial. We know that they can agree in at most 3 locations. That means that they must disagree in at least 2 locations. And we can add on all degree 3 polynomials. We are guaranteed that any two of these rows must disagree in at least two places. This is a really neat way to come up with many rows with every two rows having distance at least two between them. Except that it's not because we wanted the entries of the table to be zeros and ones, not these other integers. It's actually really easy to create a table where all the entries are different if the entries can be any integer. So that's not interesting at all. But we don't have to give up on polynomials. Instead, let's give up on the integers. Let's choose a different number system which doesn't have so many numbers. For example, modulo 5 arithmetic. Here the only numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We can add and subtract and multiply them, and since we're doing everything modulo 5, we'll still only be left with one of these five numbers. It turns out that even with this arithmetic, polynomials of degree d have at most d roots. So we can still use the same technique. It'll work as long as we're doing it modulo a prime number. Even the proof of this is in the same video that's linked in the description. Now when we create the same table, all our entries will be smaller than 5. The entries are still not zeros and ones, but nevertheless it's back to being an interesting pattern. Especially because there are over 600 rows in this table. And yet no two rows have a distance less than 2. We can count the number of rows by counting the number of polynomials. There are 4 coefficients in a polynomial, each one having 5 choices. So there are 5 to the 4, which is 625 polynomials. As we'll see, this kind of pattern will help us solve our original problem. To recap, we are trying to design a table that is 3 disjunct. That is, we have a table of pooled tests, but we want that no three people should have tests that mask the tests of another person. We intuitively thought of it as there not being much overlap in the tests. Let's see how not having much overlap actually does lead to disjunctness. If we can ensure that every two people have at most two tests in common, then that limits how much a person's tests can be masked. For instance, here we have a person's tests. Now it really doesn't matter which three people are positive. In the worst case, each positive person could have two tests in common with the first person. But even then, together they can mask at most six of the tests. Since our person had seven tests, they could not have been masked completely. So if we also ensure that everyone has at least seven tests, then three positive people can't mask anybody else. And our table is three disjunct. Now here's a table that at least sounds similar to what we need. Let's work with quadratic polynomials in modulo seven arithmetic and create a table as before. Each row has seven entries. And since they are the values of different polynomials of degree at most two, any two rows agree in at most two places. Now let's make this into a table of pooled tests. With each column, let's associate seven tests. So that's a total of 49 tests split into seven groups, one for each column. And in each group of seven tests, we number the tests from zero to six. Each row corresponds to a person. Each person will give their sample to exactly one of the tests in each of the seven groups. The entries in a person's row tell us which test in each group that person's samples go to. For instance, here are the tests of the first person. Now we can tell exactly which tests two people overlap in. The first two people overlap in exactly two tests. Test number three in the second group and test number one in the third group. So with these pooled tests, each person is participating in exactly seven tests. That's one of the conditions satisfied. And no two people can share three tests because any two rows agree in at most two places. That's the other condition satisfied. We've done it. The table we get from this will be three disjunct. How many rows does this table have? That would be the number of polynomials. Each polynomial has three coefficients with seven choices for each. So that's seven times seven times seven, which is 343 rows. We found a way to test 343 people with just 49 pooled tests with the guarantee that if at most three people are positive, we'll find out exactly who they are.
And if more are positive, we'll be able to tell that there were more than three positive cases. Now that we've seen how to create a disjunct table, let's revisit the story from the beginning where four positives were detected out of 384 people using only 48 tests. The researchers there used a very similar technique, using degree two polynomials in a number system with only eight numbers. Not modular arithmetic, but something called the finite field of order eight. They created the table by evaluating the polynomials at six points. Each test that they did contained 48 samples, and they showed evidence that that was fine even from a laboratory perspective. Now, if you go through how we reasoned, you'll see that each person is involved in six tests, and any two people overlap in at most two tests. With this, we can't conclude that this table is three disjunct. In fact, it's not. If three random people happen to be positive, it is possible with their table that a negative person could be marked as positive with a fairly large 7% chance of it happening. With four positive people, there's a much larger 50% chance of it happening, so they got quite lucky there. There are other methods one can use to improve performance in this setting. For instance, here are papers that use the viral loads indicated by the tests rather than just whether the test was positive or negative. This can help you mark people as negative even if their tests were masked by positives, and it can even help you deal with inaccuracies in your tests. Now let's talk about tables that are actually disjunct. The pattern of disjunctness is fun to think about. Here's a nice observation, and you can think about why it's true. If you use a three disjunct table, and you get four people whose tests are all positive, then all four of them must be positive. The general statement following our reasoning is as follows. If you want to test n people, and if p is a prime such that the shown inequality holds, then you can test them with p-square tests in a three disjunct manner. If you want k disjunctness, you just replace the three with a k. This amounts to slightly less than k times log n whole square tests being sufficient. Now the most important question here is whether the number of tests can be decreased. It's known that around k squared times log n tests are required. And using some neat logic, we know that when n is much larger than what we were dealing with, there actually are tables out there that use around k squared times log n tests. All of this is still an active area of research. Here are some recent papers creating disjunct tables using other approaches. The first one uses the Chinese remainder theorem to create disjunct tables. The second one uses something called the method of conditional probabilities, and it uses only around k square times log n tests when n is large. The second paper also provides the list of applications of combinatorial group testing that I mentioned near the beginning of the video. The common theme behind those applications were that when a situation arises from just a few underlying causes, we can sometimes do only a few measurements to reconstruct the underlying situation. Now let's move on to distance, which featured centrally in our approach to creating disjunct tables. We used polynomials only to come up with a table satisfying the distance pattern. Tables made in this way are called Reed-Solomon error correcting codes. Again, here are two fun questions about the specific table we created. The first perhaps a bit harder than the second. If you try to send me a row of the table, but up to two of the seven entries get changed, show that I can still unambiguously tell you which row you sent. And the other question is if you try to send me a row of the table, but up to four of the seven entries become undecipherable noise, again show that I can unambiguously tell you which row you sent. These highlight how the distance pattern leads to error correction. But in fact, they're equivalent. Error correction also leads to a distance pattern. And I plan to make a video about a hat puzzle that needs a distance pattern and how we can use error correction in order to get it. Here again, the question arises of whether there are better methods to come up with these tables. The paper I mentioned earlier does give a better way, but only for certain parameters. I won't go into details here, but this field is a very active field with lots of questions left to be answered. Since it's a fundamental pattern, it has a lot of applications. One obvious application is in communication networks, with recent advancements helping 5G networks transfer data more quickly. Other applications can even include wacky stuff, like a method to share secrets only retrievable by a majority vote, or a system that uses fingerprints as passwords without storing the user's fingerprints. As usual, links in the description. Now a very natural question is what other fun mathematical patterns are out there? And honestly, I'm not qualified to answer this as there's so much I don't know. But even in the little I know, there's a lot to tell. Take Kirkman triples, which are actually used in this paper that we saw earlier, and which stem from a famous puzzle that you can try out, known as Kirkman's schoolgirl problem. 
Reverend Kirkman, who had a major interest in mathematics and contributed to numerous fields, had come up with certain combinatorial designs and publicized them by submitting his schoolgirl problem to a recreational math magazine that had a delightful cover. The question became popular, and in the process of finding out all its solutions, some neat structures arose. These structures led to a mathematician, Jacques Cotreau, using those structures to devise a neat game of insects. Denis Blanchot then helped him make it into a card game that we now know as Dobble. The maths of Dobble has been covered by many wonderful YouTube videos. I've left links to some of those and to a fascinating article on the history of Dobble in the description. Leave a comment, or better yet, make a video if you know of a mathematical pattern that you think needs more publicity. And of course, as always, thank you for watching.